Okay, I'm rolling. Okay, I first came across this beast in a bit of a uh, hiatus in my career. Uh, the wasp thing, which you saw earlier, had just gone down the pan for the final time. You know, it had gone bankrupt four times before, but nobody managed to pull it back this time. Chris and I, Chris was the wasp designer, Chris and I sat in his front room and designed this uh, from a, a panel spec, all the stuff that had to be on it. It then took Chris a year to do the electronics to actually make that happen. And for a year I had nothing to do, no income. So I went out and sold my services as a sort of general programmer. And the first company I found that had a great synthesizer but no sounds in it was Elka. I met them at the Frankfurt show in probably 82, I think. And they were showing the prototype of this, but they had absolutely no sounds for it whatsoever. They shipped one over to me from, actually from Halstead. The British distributor was just up the road from here in Halstead. And I sat for a couple of weeks in my room and just did, did presets for it, which then got sent back to Italy and were shipped as the factory presets. Um, Probably the most famous album that this was ever used on is Rendezvous by Jean-Michel Jarre. And he actually used quite a lot of those factory presets. Uh, the one I've got up here at the moment. Famous laser harp sequence, which I think everybody's guessed by now is actually rolling on tape while he's holding his hands in the beams simply because the laser harp could never be relied on to trigger properly. Um, there's lots of other sounds on here that... Anyone familiar with that album will probably know. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the Synthex was it's probably the only polysynth in this room that's got band pass and high pass filtering. All the mono synths are bound to have it. But for some reason, most designers, whether it was sequential circuits or Moog, decided when they, for some reason, when they made a polysynth, they thought, oh, low pass filtering will be enough. You can't get a sound like that unless you have a band pass filter. Um, Somebody else that took to using this a lot, although I don't think he ever actually recorded with it, was Keith Emerson. And one of the reasons he used it was that uh, his GX1 was dying. And this was the, the only thing that could substitute for pan fanfare. And also using the sequencer, he could actually get the, uh, the bass line uh, running as well. So I used to use that live a lot um, to substitute for the uh, the big GX1 when it finally uh, pegged it. Um, someone else who got very fond of this, although much later when I took one over to the States, was Stevie Wonder. And he used to like it for these very short, sinky sounds. Because it suited his clavinet style of playing. Um, let's see what well, else? Why did the. Uh a lot of top pros used it, but why did it never really catch on with the general public? Uh, I think that was a lot to do with it. Really? The name Synthex was just... just it too... just didn't... And the fact that it came from Elka. They did sell a lot in Germany. I think that was mainly because much earlier there'd been a very famous shot of Tangerine Dream. And the only thing that you could read on any of their gear was an Elka Rhapsody at the front of the stage. So I think that the Germans took to it because they regarded it as used by professionals. But a lot of other people didn't. I mean, Jeff Downs used to use one uh, as a substitute for his Prophet 10 and 5 when they died because it's very similar to program to a Prophet. Mm. It has this capability to do the Prophet type sounds, but a lot more. It also had chorus on board, which at the time was regarded as completely uh, unprofessional because you're supposed to use external chorus units. It meant that you got a, a much fuller sound. The other thing that was really nice about it was how quick and easy the sequencer was to uh, was to come up with something. Um, unlike, uh, I don't know if you saw with the PPG, other things at the time, it was very laborious to enter things into the sequencer. 
Um, this was actually what I'm actually doing here when I play the note this button I'm tapping here represents spaces in between so it was quite easily to play the musical rest that you wanted so let's just try and find the right sound Just something simple like that would have taken about an hour to get out of a PPG and wave term. So it was, although it was never going to be a sequencer in the way sequencers are now, it was great for throwing together ideas quickly for composition. So, and uh, of course you could double the sounds. Um, so when you uh, you found one sound you like, one of the neat tricks with it was whatever the sound was, you would throw the strings behind it, and the strings acted like reverb, apart from anything else. I mean, they filled the sound if you held it down, but they sounded like reverb if you uh, played individual notes. So that had this huge sound, long before people thought of putting, you know, real reverbs and, and all that stuff. Wonderful. And I fell in love with the machine, and it kept me alive till the Oscar came out. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah. Very good, Paul. You're a star. <laughs> You're wasting that digital village. Get out.